the tide's going out. I love it. It's creating disruption. It's creating, you know, you got debt disruption, you got operating expense disruption, you got occupancy disruption. All that stuff is awesome. Sure. Because I, I you know, as, a, as somebody who's trying to buy real estate, I need, you know, the amateurs to get out mid 25. Apartment construction falls off a cliff. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. we had a serious supply problem in 18 months. I, I just think the next 18 months are can be the best like to buy. <laughs> We're back. Season two, Multifamily Forward, presented by Mark Taylor Residential. I'm Adam Greco, and as always, my partner in crime, Mr. JC, John Carlson. Good to be President back. President of Mark Taylor. Good to be Good back. Good to see you again. Good to friend. see you. Um, what a way to start off season two with our special guest. Uh, Celebrity-esque. So we're going to hold off on on the intro just yet. So let's just uh, let's talk about our topic first. Sure. Um, we're going through how to optimize performance in a market downturn. Uh, John, what are you seeing as the most important market market influences in today's today's landscape? So, Adam, usually I'm off the cuff, uh, but today because of our celebrity guest, you had to be on I'll your say game. That way, yeah, I had to be on my game. So, nice. Uh, but I thought it was an interesting topic, so I put some thought behind it. And just made a list, um, and I'll run down it, and we can discuss it later with our guest. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of factors that contribute to all things multifamily. Um, so I, I just started uh, broad picture. So okay. global geopol- geopolitical events. So when you think about um, the things that are happening around the world, wars, pandemics, um, disruptions to, to global trade, shipping vessels, all of those things, those things impact supply chains. They impact... Uh, our economic environment, which shifts to, you know, number two, economic conditions. Sure. What are we doing locally, statewide, nationally in terms of economic health? How is that performing? Uh, I think of inflation, you know, a, a significant topic over the last two years. Right. Uh, and certainly a contributor to our expenses and where we're going as a multifamily direction. So uh, the Fed, interest rates, uh, the regulatory environment, demographics, supply and demand, of course, we're cresting in terms of supply nationally and in Arizona. So how does that really transition the environment for a landlord and a renter? Uh, and then technological advances. I think that's one of the few things that's giving us an opportunity from a both an ownership and operational perspective mm-hmm. to really create efficiencies long-term. A lot of these are, are, are negative towards our environment. So uh, I think demographic trends, uh, the technological advances are really helping us mm-hmm. move forward to kind of shape or reshape how we do things. And I think of centralization which is a key topic and I think something that, you know, we've doubled down on and will continue to just to really enhance performance in production for our clients and our, our staff. So I think, you know, I'll end with, I think, innovation and being able to adapt to a new environment that has to continue. So I think the groups that do that will be successful. I think it's time to let the cat out of the bag. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. So our special guest, none other than Mr. Ken McElroy from MC Companies, and I have a long litany of other very, very impressive tasks that he performs on a daily basis. So uh, let's bring him in first, and then I'm gonna run through a whole list, because I had to write everything down, by the way. What a way, and what a treat to start off uh, season two for Multifamily Forward. JC, um, I- I'm gonna say this now, first off, Welcome, Mr. Ken McElroy. Kenny Mack, thank you so much Thanks, for being man. here oh, with us. It's great to be back. It's been 30 years I walked in 30 years. We're going we're gonna <laughs> to dive like into that, that too. <laughs> yeah, that's where we got to share a little How bit. How about that? By the way, the Amazing. paint's still the same. Same paint. Yeah. It's been it's fresh. It's the same up. color nice. just each year. Well, you're waiting on Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Picking colors. <laughs> Um, Ken, I, uh, Kenny, I want to mention this because uh, I did ask you to see if you would even be willing to join the podcast. Um, there might have been a couple of adult, adult beverages that were consumed on a golf course. I was trying to get my timing just perfectly for you to say yes. Uh, by the way, you didn't even hesitate. Yep. You were of so gracious with your time. Yeah. No, listen, I love this industry. I, we uh, all know and, you do. And I'll tell you, like, what you guys do is hard. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Well, let's start from the top because, again, I have a whole list of items here. So not only are you an owner-operator, a developer, um, you have your own podcast. Let's plug that right now, uh, Real Estate uh, Strategies. You're also an author. Let me list all these books real quick. Um, ABCs of Real Estate Investing, 
The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing and the Sleeping Giant. Any more in the works? That yeah, word? we've got a few others. Yeah. So when do I get my signed copy? Whenever you like. All right. Yeah, All right. Yeah. I'm going to hold you to that. That's right. I'm going to hold you to that. Not only that, but uh, your wife, Danielle, is also you know part of your podcast. Uh, I'm assuming she keeps you in line or is it vice versa? Well, so what happened was, like you guys, you, you the podcasts have a life of their own. And then really, you guys, and we're all running at a higher level. And the majority, I would say, of the real estate investors are single family, duplexes, stuff like that. So because she has several of those, she brings a great perspective. So that's why we brought her in because sometimes she's like, hold on, hold yes. on, hold <laughs> on. Like you're up at 30,000 feet. You need to bring it down. Like what if somebody doesn't have any money and they're buying one? That's so, fantastic. Yeah. So that was kind of the point there. I love it. Yeah. I love it. You know, and, and I uh, want to also mention your just, you mentioned on your webpage or podcast uh, about networking, how important networking is. And you have a partnership with Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. Uh, rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. Was, how did that even come to fruition? Well, <laughs> long story. No, I, 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 there's a couple of things that happen. One is, you, you know, w when I, when you're looking for cash, you right. Know, you're looking for anybody that will listen. Right. So Robert had, they had just launched rich dad, poor dad this is 25 some years ago. And, and I um, didn't quite know who he was, but I read the book before I met him. And, and uh, I'm, for me, it was just one more LP dinner, right? Yeah. Literally. Who's this guy? Da, da, da. Well, so then he invited me to this conference. And I swear this is true. I forgot. So, <laughs> so I got up on a Sunday morning. I was like, oh my God, like Robert invited me to this thing. It started Friday and Saturday, it burned through. Of course, it's Sunday morning. And I'm like, I get up. I have flip-flops on, tank top. And um, I roll into the room. I'm thinking it's, you know, I'm just going to kind of observe and see what's up. No, it's 400 people fully buttoned up, you know, teaching, educating. This is way back where I went with Chet Poor Dad kind of launched. And so he pulls me up on stage. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Were so, they the nice flip-flops? They were. They were, yeah, they were They were nice. One was, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> I go, he goes, he walks off stage, he goes, tell him what you know, swear to God. And that was uh, when we met, li literally. And and this, um, and then from there, I just realized I really like to teach. I like to talk about this business. Uh, I like to help people shortcut. I don't want anybody to lose any money. Um, and so it turned into the books and, and all those things. So, you know, Robert's been a good friend. and That's fantastic. Yep. Well, let's roll this back a little bit, a little bit of history. I mean, you're, you're already sharing, uh, sharing some with us. You were the former president of Mark Taylor. Yep. And uh, when you walked back into this office, you mentioned 30 years ago. I was talking to Josh. He's like, well, you know, where are we going? What are we doing? I go, oh. Yeah. And I said, oh, gosh, I've been in this building in 30-some years. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, I, I mean, I even go back and I'm listening to stories just uh, with Goodman Real Estate, just how yep. everything got, you know, well, that's just started. How Scott and I met, you know, at, at uh, Goodman, John Goodman at the time. I went through a couple of team changes. Uh, I think when we left, it was Pinnacle, I believe. But he was running Phoenix. I was running Vegas. And, right. you know, I moved here. And he met Jeff. And, you know, the rest is history. So let's you, you left Mark Taylor and then created MC Company. Yeah. Actually, I started McElroy Management first. So I okay. started doing what you guys are doing, which is, I believe, the hardest thing ever, which is fee management, you know. Um, I, it is. It's the hardest business. And uh, I started that. And then yeah, I was like, man... I'm busy, but I don't have a business, you know? Like, right. Um, I was just high paid um, fee management. And and so I said, I need to start buying these again. And I, I owned stuff at the time, like small stuff. And I was investing my money into onesie twosies. And then I just started, you know, I need to buy bigger. I need to get 200 units and up and start buying them. And that would have been, gosh, the 90s probably. Wow. So maybe... Yeah, probably about then. So, yeah, I just started. And then my philosophy, uh, oh, you know, what happens is you, that opens another door, right? You you have, you're, you're now in an arena with people that own stuff, which, you know, you are in fee management too, but um, now you're asking different questions. And, right. And, and you're, and there's also, I met, I have found a mentor at that point. His name was Leonard Litwin and he had a company called Glenwood Management and, He's since passed away, but he had 10,000 units in Manhattan. <laughs> and so I mean, he was on the Forbes list and all that. And, you know, it's it's like that that scene, you know, with 
Billy Crystal, you know, the, the one thing, you know. Right. Um, and, and I was, his was, you know, just hold on and ride ride the cycles. You know, there's going to be down cycles. There's going to be up down. cycles. Yeah. And let the real estate do its thing and then, you know, just focus on really good operations. And and so I did that kind of, you know. I went through a period <laughs> sure. of, you know, multiple buy and sells and condo conversions, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I realized how much harder that was. So, yeah, it's been a great run. Well, you already mentioned how much you love this industry. Yeah. Uh, everything from, again, uh, owner, operator, developer, uh, starting your, you know, your own a very popular podcast, author. What has been the most rewarding piece of this? So today we were at the gym, literally, and, you know, this woman comes up to me, like, which happens all the time now. And she's like, you know, she, she owns uh, six, five or six uh, high-end dress shops. And, you know, so there's a zillion people out there like that trying to make a living. And, um, you know, she's like, I started, you know, just slowly investing with one, two, three. And now she's, you know, she, she's got this passive income coming in from real estate. We all know this, right? Um, that's what I love. That's, that actually is what gives me the fuel is, is you know, you're changing. Um, I can't even tell you how many times it's thousands of people. Uh, you, you, you know, just give them a little bit of confidence um, on how to do things. You know, they're hard. Most of the people in this country are really hardworking people. Right. They pay a lot of tax. And unfortunately, when they get toward retirement, they look around and, you know, like it or not, Wall Street's, you know, absconded with most of that through fees and, yeah. you know, all, you know, we can go down this road, but it's a fact, you know, the, the system set up for the normal folk to put their money into pensions, 401ks and, you know, all the retirement plans and all that kind of stuff. And then we use that money to, to buy stuff, right. right? you know, like, you, you know, and, and then there's all kinds of fees, nothing wrong with that. So I, I believe that, you know, my, the reason why I'm doing all this is, is to, um, open people's minds and, and not have them be all in with a financial planner, wealth manager, or stock market as, um, th as their end result. Right. Yeah. No, very, I love it. Uh, what do you think? You guys want to jump into the meat and potatoes? Sure. Whatever you like. Let's dive in. Uh, Kenny, let's, let's get your viewpoint. How do you see the market as of today? Multifamily specific, of course. Well, I think that if somebody came into this business, you know, six, seven years ago, you know, you know, I, I, I say that you got rent appreciation, you got market appreciation, and you have eagle appreciation, you know, nice. like, like there's a lot of people that made a lot of money that are idiots. Uh, and so I personally love where we're headed in the next two years. Uh, I really believe that because what they're going to learn is that the market doesn't always go up. You know, you're not going to have this kind of rent growth. Uh, you know, we all know we've been in the business long enough. One, two, three percent is rent growth is what you budget, and that's historically what we've done. It's just been weird, you know. <laughs> right. And and um, and also, you know, markets don't always go up. And, and, and this is a, so, a lot of folks have just come in. They think raising capital is kind of the, you know, the 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 piece that is the most important. And it's the it's actually quite easy if you're an influencer yeah. online, you raise money. I mean, these guys are don't know what they're doing, and and then they maybe manage it themselves, or maybe if they're lucky, they come to a company like yours to manage for them if they're smart. But Thank most you, of them don't. So for me, this is a great opportunity for you know, as as Warren Buffett would say, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. So the tide's going out. I love it. It's creating disruption. It's creating, you know, you got debt disruption, you got operating expense disruption, you got occupancy disruption, you got market disruption, absorption issues. All that stuff is awesome. Sure. Because I, I as, as somebody who's trying to buy real estate, I need, you know, the amateurs to get out. So and that's what's going to happen. The market's going to do that, hopefully, uh, over the next couple of years. So I am so excited about the next couple of years Good. it's going to be tough don't get me wrong especially you know you know things like what you guys do because my experience has been that a lot of these people they're they're not really that smart when it comes to how these things should run and so they buy incorrectly and what they do 
because they don't take ownership for anything a lot of times is they fire management companies and then they just, you know, replace them and replace them and replace them. And, you know, what they're really trying to do is, is point the finger at management as opposed to them. You know, maybe they uh, overpaid, maybe they didn't underwrite their expenses right. Maybe they thought the, you know, all that stuff like management companies don't really often get involved at the time that they should. Right. They usually take, you know, the hot potato after it's already baked, you know, and, and now, now you have whatever they did, whatever decisions they made for debt, equity, uh, operating expenses or whatever it is, market, you know, you have like, <laughs> you know, and then you have to work through that stuff. And, and so, you know, what they do is they, they don't, they don't, um, they don't look at themselves as, as the problem as they can't because they're trying to raise more money and buy, another, buy something else. So I love this time. You know, it's going to be hard for owners. Right. Um, you know, the best companies like you guys, honestly, are going to survive. And you're going to do just it. fine. I I strongly believe that. that you know, I, I've i talked to, gosh, hundreds of people that have raised money in the last couple of years. And they manage the stuff themselves. And they're 50, 60, 70, 80% occupied. Just idiots, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> don't hold back, you know, any. Well, they're just trying to like, they're, they, you know what they're doing? They're like. They're trying to save on that management fee. And if they really knew that, like, at the end of the day, you're like, do you really make much on management? The answer is no, it's tough. It's tough business. So, you, you know, so, you, you know, <laughs> but they're doing it because they think it's easy. And and so, what you know, what's going to happen is they're going to have to turn to these third-party managers. They don't even know how to talk to them, interview them, or anything. And they don't even know what they're doing. So, they don't even, they can walk onto a property and look at a vacancy, but that's about it, you know. But so, what's, yeah, what you can predict though is that they're going to ask or, or request the same five or ten things that are predictable every right. time they buy a deal yeah. incorrectly. Correct. Right? So there's no way to solve for a bad deal through Correct. management. You can you cut around the edges, right? Uh, but oh, we're going to cut marketing. We're going to cut personnel. No longer so are we capital it. investing. Like, and you're just, right, John. Like that frustrates the heck out of me because what we, you need is marketing, and what you need is what you really should double down on are people. Um. And marketing. We're going to talk about this yeah. a little bit later. Um, so with all of this experience, you've seen, t you know, peak, you've seen down at the bottom in the trough. Um, how would you compare this cycle compared to, let's say, post-GFC or even the dot-com dot com bubble? Is there a comparison? No, this is nothing. Like, oh, it was rough. You know, we bought stuff, you know, five, six, seven, eight. I was buying. So- you know, what saved me was management. Yeah. You know, because, you know, what will save people next is management. If if they, you know, have that rate cap or if they've got fixed rate debt, let's say, and if they have enough reserves, which usually the answers are those are no. But if they have, you know, mm -hmm. so I went through, you know, 08, 7, 8, 9, they were rough years. But if you had re a really good management company, a, right. a really good management program and good people and good culture and all that kind of stuff, you just work through it and great communication, of course, to the partnerships. So what you don't often know are, you know, how are the partnerships communicating? Right. Right. So, you know, they take your report and then they say, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, if whatever, who knows what they say. You're like, you know, you guys know, like, it's just, um, there's no accountability on the partnership side and the ownership side generally. So I, I think, you, you know, going, going through that period of time, it was probably a good painful few years but again what did i do as all that disruption was happening and banks were taking back assets and partnerships were falling apart and cash calls and all that stuff and property management was going moving all over the place because that's normal um what did i do i went up to canada i put together a hundred million dollar fund and i started buying apartments in texas at 40 50 cents on the dollar and uh because during those kinds of disrupt disruptive times, um, that's when the deals you want to. That's when you want them, right? You know, you guys are trying to save the partnerships. It's fine. I want the ones that aren't going to get saved. You know, those are those are the. You, and, those you are know, the opportunities. Those are the opportunities. Price per pound. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you know, so this is. Um, it'll be interesting to see where we had. You know, we have some supply coming, uh, like a million plus units, I think, being delivered in the next eighteen months. But we're still way behind. So it'll be temporary, you know, but then after that, 
gosh, 26, um, actually about mid-25, apartment construction falls off a cliff. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. we're, we had a serious supply problem in 18 months. So it'll be, a, I, I just think the next 18 months are going to be the best like, to buy. <laughs> and you're speaking nationwide. You're not just to Arizona. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Arizona is the you're same, looking, though. I, I yeah. look at, Arizona is really super healthy. You know, I, I think as a, um, as a state, people want to be here. It's still affordable, even though it's more than it was. You know, you go go around, you know, go, right. just go look around. It's expensive everywhere. I'm not moving back yeah. to Chicago. I'm yeah. staying here. Yeah, so I- This is where I, 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 I love yep. it. But I, yeah, I, I look at stuff, you know, we're, we're bidding on stuff right now at way below replacement costs. You know, because we're builder, you know, like you guys. So, right. you know, you build it, let's call it 300 a door, you know, let's just say, with land. Mm-hmm. You, you can buy that stuff right now at 230, 240, it's 250. finally moved yeah. below that threshold. Okay, so yeah. so it makes sense to do that. So, you know, so that's what we're focusing on now, brand new product, and um, that you don't have all that development and construction risk, you know. So, again, it's just, you know, though the mistakes that people make, Early on, right, just take advantage of those. Or you, when you think of, uh, you've seen the irrational bubble, right? Yeah. So you get euphoric, yeah, uh, as investors, I love that. right, I love that. and then greed factors yeah. in. Correct. Now we're in capitulation, and those guys that right. were in that element and they were just going, you know, hundred hundred miles per hour. I mean, those are the opportunities, right? Those are the price per pounds. I'm not right. saying it's as extensive as nine, right. ten, eleven, but they will exist. Yeah, like. In the in 08, let's say, you know, remember you could fog a mirror and buy a house back then, sure. right? That just happened with syndication. Mm. Same thing. Exact same thing. They don't Good know. Point. They don't know much, right? Yeah. And they, they don't know. They just know that they underwrote the deal that it's going to do as like it did the last two years. Well, it's not, as you right. know. So it's going to be a great time. So let's look at this. I mean, in a current market downturn, let's look at it from two different ways: ownership and then management. Yeah. All right. right. I'll, I'll refer to you first, Kenny, on, on on ownership. So, what long-term strategies can you deploy to ensure continued success? Well, so uh, we've had this conversation a lot, and I've ch- chatted with JC about this. Yeah. You, you know, like the best we can do during the next two years is maximize the NOI to the best of our ability. Of course. So are we maximizing occupancy in that particular market? You know, are the rents at market or close? You know, what's the lost lease and where are our expenses? And, and you know, those are controllables that sure. we all have the ability to do. And you guys do that really, really well. Um, that's the best we can ask for because if there's a change in ownership or management, you know, that's the bar. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's how I look at it. And so if I'm meeting with a lender, for example, on a project that I bought, and uh, my occupancy is at 85 or uh-huh. 89, that comes up. Right. Okay? So I want to go in there where it's 94, 95, and I, I want to talk, you know, I want to make sure all that stuff's dialed. So that's off the table. Yeah. And now we're just talking about the debt or, you know, whatever, yeah. right? Like, listen, you know, take this asset back, for example, or, um, you know, what are you going to do with it? Which they don't want to do. Correct. Right. So the, the, the best investors in the world, and I mean this, are the ones that engage the property management in the beginning. And they're the ones that hold them higher than the, the accountant or the, the lawyer or anybody else on the team. To basically tell them what's up, say you know this is this is what we're looking to buy, and what do you think, JC? Let's well, look I, at this from the lens of MT Mark yeah, Taylor. You know, I think so. As a owner operator and third party right. group, uh, you know, I think you know we do things pretty well from the owner management perspective. We understand the business, you know, nearly forty years uh, in uh, at this point. But I think from the third party side. We've shifted a bit during the upswing to really focus on the upfront relationship and being transparent and them understanding our philosophy along with us asking a lot of good questions. Right. Uh, you know, I've made many screw ups over the years. Uh, I think more than ever now we focus on what that relationship looks like. Uh, do we align? Is there a synergy? Uh, because I can tell you when you get in bed with the, with the wrong philosophical owner in management company, there's a lot of this during that process. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter no. what you say or do. 
uh, it's it's never going to work out. So I think the best decisions I've made is is turning down business, sure, uh, and walking away from some business, sure. Because, you know, why put yourself in that position? Your teams, uh, your staffs, all of those things to have this real uh, messy dynamic, sure. So really, for us, I'll think of new business underwriting every deal, really saying, hey, you know, this is what we really think this deal can can do or perform for the next twelve months. Uh, you know, into our five year plan. Does it align with ownership? Are they unrealistic? I had guys during 17, 18, 19, syndicators, different groups saying, well, we're we're putting 10% rent growth through 2025. <laughs> Why? That right. doesn't make any sense. And we're compressing our our, 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 our rent cap on the X. Ex- no, no, no. Don't do those things. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it's education. It's, it's being aligned philosophically and moving forward together with the right relationship. You guys mentioned this earlier when we were talking, just uh, uh, the, the groups and the firms that at, at- Purchase at the peak, mm. right? Uh, using non-traditional uh, means of financing, uh, 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 interest rates are continuously increasing. What? Where do you go from there if you're that group? Is there a solution that is viable? Well, it depends on the group, and it depends on how they're communicating to their debt and equity. You know, I can tell you, like these folks do not want the real estate backed. Correct. Like John John said earlier, it's true. Yeah, they don't. You know, and they always want to throw, you know, they'll never say, ah, you know, I'm, you know, I probably shouldn't have done eight or 10 or nine or 11 or 12%, you know, on my equity. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, or I, I shouldn't have, you know, I, I should have got a rate cap or I should have went fixed or whatever it is, you know, you know, they're not going to do that. Yeah. And oftentimes you guys know, uh, you know, how the properties are running, but sometimes you don't know, you know, how they're capitalized behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, this is the time where, you know, wisdom kind of steps in, right? And, and you know, we, like, we, we got kind of scared when the pandemic hit. Of and course. what I mean is, obviously, we didn't know who was going to pay rent, all those kinds of things. And so we went back and looked at our reserves. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I had three months, and I thought that was enough. And I went to six yeah. Went to six months on every project. Now it took time, you know, we had a plan for it. So we have six months of cash for every project, non distributable, right? And we went through a period of time. Those are decisions owners can make. Sure. But they don't always do it because they promise something on the front end and, you know, they're trying to raise money over here. So, you know, so they have to distribute, um, right? So, and they don't quite know. They think, oh, it's going to be better next month. But I think ownership's going to get challenged in the next two years a lot. And uh, so that'll be interesting to see, you know, how they how, how they handle that. But uh, to your point, part of the reason you guys have uh, keep accounts, do a great job, and are growing is because that vetting process, uh, you know, you vet an owner just like a tenant. And uh, that's why, you know, it's like you don't have evictions because, you know, you do the vetting. It's the same thing with partnerships. The alignment of the yeah. actual partnership. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, I, I like agree. to say, I mean, uh, you know, in, I'll say, interview situations, hey, you're going to celebrate with us when we move rents higher, but you also have to let us move rents lower because it's going to happen, you know, daily, weekly, monthly. Yeah. So allow us to do what we do. Correct. And, and we'll give you the data and be transparent on the back end to help you understand why we're moving in this direction. Yep. It's very methodical and thoughtful, but support us in that process. Correct. Don't don't, right. don't hit the brake when we're, we're going this way. Yep. Temporarily. So let's let's roll right into this because uh, having those conversations uh, when they want you to reduce expenses. So we're talking about operating expenses, yeah. right? And we mentioned earlier the, one of the worst things to do is to reduce marketing, personnel, admin, etc. Um, what are some of the uh, expense control measures that you would put in place? Well, well, I, I would say that. Let me back up a step. So. You know, we've walked a lot of communities yeah. over the years, uh, and there's some very obvious things that happen uh, when this decision making starts to happen in a negative way. So, you walk a community, oh, landscaping, it's just granite or rock. All of the plants are gone because yeah. they die, they pull them, they oh, don't replace. No care. So, you see that start to happen, and or there's dead plants. Um, you see no staff, right? Yeah. Because they're pulling back on staff. Yep. Um, the property looks tired and, 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 and you go online, right? Because that is the digital footprint to your community. Sure. Can't find them, right? Because they pull back advertising. 
So they start to just really double down on really bad decisions and impact the performance of their asset. Okay. And then three months later, six months later, because it happens quickly, they come to third party manager. What's going on? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I know we made some adjustments, yeah. but you know, why is my asset performing this way? And it's just so short sighted, uh, and it doesn't really. I mean, there's no no understanding from my side. If if you really understand this business at seventy percent, that you would make those decisions. Sure. Uh, I think it's it's about being long for the haul. Meaning, you know, cycles do this, but are you prepared? As Kenny mentioned, smartly. Uh, they adjusted the reserves, as many good owners right. did. We did too, from three to six or whatever it is, or a year, uh, because we didn't know what was going to happen. So really protecting your investment uh, on the front end. But there's there's groups, as Ken mentioned, we got to distribute, right? Yep. Uh, owner Tom has daughters Susie and, yep. and son Jim, or Jim, and they need that you know $10,000 a month because that's how they live. Car. <laughs> they have a fast car. <laughs> got, got to feed the Ferrari. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's bad decision making. Understand, yeah, but bad but, capital stacks. But John's right. Call. Like you, you step into those assets that are tired. Sure, um, there's a reason they're tired. You know, they, they they stop cutting that stuff, and what really it needs is a capital injection, which they don't have a lot of times. And so that's the balance. That's uh, that's where we're heading next. Is that it, you, you're going to start to see as they just try to keep their properties out of the bank, let's say, or the lender, or whoever it is they're going to have to sacrifice ops and you're going to start to see that next. It, it's just, we're not going to reinvent the wheel that, that right. just will happen. Right. They have to pay tax. They have to pay insurance. They have to pay the mortgage. Other than that, well, maybe utilities, it's, it's all kind of a jump ball. Right? And, and so I pulled for this exercise. I pulled sure. the NAA's uh, most recent reports. So they did a year over year over year, 2022 versus 2021 expenses. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's significant in terms of increases and in just taxes, insurance, utilities. This is across a million units plus nationwide. It's almost 60%. Correct. I mean, it's significant. It's so, right. you know, that the things unreal. that you can't control, insurance, 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 we're going to have Crest on yep. uh, hopefully in a few weeks. Uh, you know, in certain states, you're getting badgered, right? And then there's rent control on top of you. So you have this you regulatory it. pressure. That's right. Uh, and all of these expenses that we're absorbing as ownership landlords. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 going to get more difficult. Yeah, I'll say it that way. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll just you know our our insurance bill for our firm was let's say three million. Um, it went to four. So seems you, like you, overnight too, huh? Yeah, like it's thirty. Let's say, and I well, I feel like we negotiated. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel like down it. from fifty to thirty. Well, what yeah. a smile on your face. Yeah, as you I say was it. like, man, like. And then I think we put another million up for self-insurance, you know, just to not pay claims for, you know, kitchen fires and little things that happen. So, you know, so again, that that makes its way into cash flow or negatively, right? And so does property tax and so does utility and all that stuff. And so when an owner or a partnership buys based on not a 30% increase insurance, they're looking for us or you guys to increase occupancy or or cut somewhere else or you, you know they're you're always trying to solve to a number and uh, i understand that completely and that, so that i think is what we're going to start to see yeah so, you know that's what not everybody's looking at you guys are because you guys are right facing the fire on that every day but owners really our partnerships are really looking at the the, the interest rate the reserves or the cap and they're you know they're dealing with the debt you know meanwhile <laughs> You know, you've got op operating expenses just jumping off, you know, right. off the page. Right, and you're not, and you, you're you're missing out on the, you know, I'll I'll say the, the, sixteen through twenty twenty one run where you could just put a property in the market and you'd have, a I mean, great time to be a broker. Yeah, seven best and finals. Correct. Right? And 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 now it's like, uh, you know, what are you going to price it at? Are you going to get five to the table? Uh, what's the number going to be? Is it going to be below your purchase price? So, you know, the variables change. You don't have an exit strategy from a sales perspective like you did then. It's a we, completely different scenario. Yeah, I was in escrow on a deal in Tucson. It was 100, let's just say it was 100 million. And I had a, like a $3 million NOI, I think, going off of memory. While I was in escrow, my debt went up. I had a debt term sheet from mm-hmm. day one. Sure. My debt went up and it lowered the cash flow from three to two. And I think that's what it was. It was three million in cash flow. It lowered the cash flow from three to two, and it's the same property. So while I'm in escrow, 
So you can imagine, and it was a value add too, 700 bucks in the unit, you know, for value add. And I was like, man, like that's what debt did. It, it you know, so we 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 had to pass because yeah. you know, uh, two million on 30 million is a lot different than three million on 30 million down, let's say. So that's what, you know, those are the decisions you have to make. Um, and that's what's debt, that, what debt has done to cash flow. And now operating expenses are kind of trailing back behind. The power well, of the Fed and, and interest rate levels. Yeah. You have George on, I guess. I, I know, about exactly. That. Let's lean in on personnel. Yeah. Uh, our just amazing men and women that are on this uh, on our individual sites just making it happen every single day. Um, we all know labor cost has definitely escalated. Um, is there a solution besides reducing personnel? Because that's the last thing that anyone wants. Those are the pe people that are making it happen for us. You have any solutions? Any recommendations? Um, it's that's a tough one because yeah. it's kind of a market driven deal. Yeah. I know you, you know during the pandemic we we saw some of those repricing. Um, what we really need um, is more unemployment, and I know that's a tough pill to swallow. It's hard to say. The Fed will tell you that unemployment was at three seven. I think they they're, they're saying that we should be at four five, and that's kind of normal. So. Low, low, em, low employment or low unemployment, I should say, is inflationary. Yeah. Just by its nature. So, you know, what you're talking about is real. And though that's inflationary. And so the Fed, one of their problems, you know, if you look, they're, they're saying that there could be a million more people out of work in the next year. Um, and the reason is, is that if the Fed's going to fight inflation, they, unfortunately, they have to have higher unemployment. It's a bizarre way to think, but it is, you know, how, yeah. you know, shelter, which they call housing is inflationary. Rent growth is inflationary and mortgage payments and all that kind of stuff. And so is labor. So they're, you know, they're, they're hanging their hat on energy or, you know, gas prices and food and, you know, all this stuff. And those have come back in line. I think it's hard to know, but, <laughs> but the one thing that we all know is labor's going up Yeah, and insurance costs to employ those people is going up. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are going up and including the rent. You know, yeah. You know, and it might, maybe not over the next couple of years, it'll, you know, but when, you know, when you go from eight or 10% rent growth to two, you know, it's just, it, it's like inflation went from nine to three, but it's still three. Right. You know, like, right. So, you know, and, and you know, we're not really at the point where we're starting to see the, you know, big concessions, although there are some here and there, you know, but, uh, you know, that will come. I, there, think, I was with, just going to say supply. they're coming. With yeah. supply. Yeah. yeah. And you couple Gee. in with unemployment, the fact that we've been swelling in terms of deliveries. So management companies, growth orientated all across the country got higher, higher, higher. So yep. good rates are up yep. and higher rates are up, which creates what? Wage inflation. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys, like, I mean, well, the one thing that helps you is that your culture and your company has, you know, obviously been in business since the 80s and 40 years. And, and, and so you, you have a competitive advantage of legacy and culture. And, and I think if a professional in this industry, that's what they want, mm -hmm. I believe. They Thank want you. that. So yeah. there's something for that. There's value in that. And um, that's a huge competitive advantage that you guys have. That's great. You know, JC, uh, you mentioned this in season one, of course, and uh, M Mark Taylor's been working on this since 2018, centralization, ION, integrated operations network. How has, especially with the uh, escalated labor cost, how has that platform helped our clients? Uh, I mean, it's it's still in process, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the playbook's in place. Uh, yeah. The technology that we have today is here. Uh, I think if you look at, just use Uber as an example, as an app, how easy it is to use. Uh, we're not there, right? We're a light years away from, you know, just oh, on my phone, I click the dot, car shows up, I go to my destination, automatically paid, I can tip if I want, done. Uh, I feel like we're a long way from that, but going in that direction. So I think, you know, for operators, owners that think that, you know, centralization and technology is not the wave of the future, you're dead wrong, in my opinion. Right. And I think it's it's those that figure that out, right? It's those that understand that adapting in technology and taking advantage of that going forward will work for you uh, in your in your tenant base right. because they want that. 
Uh, we've learned that through the pandemic in terms of how we're serving our population or our resident base. So uh, I think it affords us opportunities to give our employees a better working environment as well, right? They're not doing agree. things that are tedious that can be done by AI. Yes. Um, they're still the most important piece of the equation, but let's offset some of the things that, you know, just are are, are done automatically, right? Things that we take for, for advantage in Excel. You do, you do a, a formula, it, it creates the output. Well, that's what AI is going to do and generative AI. So uh, I think there's opportunities for companies to take advantage of that and give employees Exciting a too. lift. Mm -hmm. Exciting too. You mentioned, of course, you know, Uber rideshare. I was just in LA over the weekend and it was my first experience. I'm on sunset and all of a sudden at a stoplight, I see a robot going across four wheels. I mean, it was like this tall off the ground and it was delivery service for food. And it was stopping for the cars that were crossing in, in the other direction. I've never seen that before. Did you steal the food? I wanted to jump out of the car and just, I wanted to see what, what was going on. I, I couldn't They're believe They're looking it. for you. Who was taller? <laughs> uh, it, it was the robot. It was the robot. Uh, oh, again, the car's got to be able to see the right? robot. Yeah. Again, looking ahead, um, how should multifamily prop, uh, properties position themselves to capitalize on the opportunities when the market does come back eventually? Because again, cyclic, it's, it's cyclical, right? Up and down. Yeah. So I always, you know, having been through a few cycles now, um, the as a it depends on if I'm a manager or, uh, or an owner. So if I'm an owner, I actually, uh, yeah, I always try to look to solve a problem, whatever the problem is. So for new construction, that's construction debt. Right. Might be, they might have a great contractor, you know, maybe they're stalling in their lease up. So that could be an opportunity. So I'm looking for what I would consider to be broken stuff. Right. So I sure. could go in, capitalize it, put better debt on it, you know, and then lease it up. You know, we, we obviously have our own in-house, but you know, uh, people that don't would, could use a company like yours. Uh, so I think, you, you, you know, but there's going to be a fair amount of right now, the majority of what was bought in the last three years is not worth the debt. Let's just be honest. Right. When cap rates go from four to five, that's 20%. Actually, they've gone more than that, but let's mm -hmm. just, let's just say 20%. Easy math. Yeah. So if you bought some at a hundred and, uh, it's 20% less, it's, um, you know, most of the equity has gone, if not all. So you have that issue, uh, but I do believe if you can, I say you know, stay alive to 25, you know, like, uh, if it, it, you know, so th you have that issue. On the property management side, this is the time where um, really smart, high, um, well-capitalized groups are going to come in and use you guys. They're going to go to lenders and the lenders are going to need you, you know, big groups that understand the bigger picture uh, are going to use you. And, and, um, you know, so, so, so for me, I, I think it's going to be a tough time for property management. Yeah. The next two years. Yeah. But, and, you know, the, and technology is to John's point, it's not going to save the day. Like these numbers of, you know, I, I was, I won't say who, but I was playing golf in yeah. our, in our group that day. Yeah. And I was talking to the person I was playing golf with and yeah. he said on one of his assets in Florida, his, his mortgage payment, you know, on the project went from two fifty to over five hundred, you know, a month. So, so when that happens, when you double your mortgage payment in a month, there's no value add strategy. There's no kills you. Know, you. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, so you know, so if you can get through these times, sure. And you know, I think, I think, first of all, this we're heading toward a renter nation. I hate to say it, but it's true. The you know housing affordability, single family, it's unattainable. Single family is not. It's at forty percent of the you know the listings are at forty percent of historical averages. So you're 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 not going to have any relief on that side of it. Um, even if they lower rates, which you know is is a big hot potato for this year, I think they'll probably lower them on the way toward the election. But you know, you're not going to get to most people's no, current right. thirty year. No, fixed. and then the houses that are that are available yeah. to supply, it's going to be a bidding war. Correct, right? And so, so you have a shortage, and um, it, it, it's just it's not going to solve itself. The only thing that can solve our housing problem is supply. Yeah, that's it. 
Yeah. Like, cause we know, like we've all come up in this business. We know when there's a lot of units that come into an area, we're all fighting for the same tenant and the vacancies go up and, you know, marketing expenses go up and all that stuff happens. Well, right now there's, you know, they're going to, they're going to hang their hat on this little, you know, bubble of supply that's coming, sure. but then it's gone. Sure. And so, and all it's still really doing is fulfilling a need. So it's going to happen. I think we're, you know, four or five, if you look at NMHC or NAA or uh, National Home Builders or National Co uh, uh, Coalition of, of, of Low Income, you know, they're all in a four to seven million shortage number, like all of them. Sure. Like they're all say, you know, we have that much in the U.S. A shortage. Well, what will happen, pockets will be tough, right? You'll have, you know, units being built in certain pockets and, you know, that'll that'll absorb itself out. It'll be rough in the in, in the short term. But really, really, really good in the long term. So, right. you know, Ross and I, we strongly believe that we should be buying as much as we can over the next eighteen months at the right numbers, um, and um, and then the market's going to do its thing. You know, yeah. the shortage and the you know, if you look at population growth, it's going like this. You look at housing supply, it's going like this. Well, it doesn't really matter who's in office, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, interest rates will slow that down, but it really hurts single family more than us. Yeah. More True. than the rail side, you know, we really work opposite of each other. <laughs> like people rent, especially in your communities, you know, yep. they, they, they rent there and then they buy a house normally. I, I, even though we all as an industry want to say, you know, renters by choice. The re reality is, is at the end of the day, the tax laws are set up for that single family person and, and people build equity that way. And so I'm, what I'm most concerned about moving forward is, you know, people like Josh, you know, 21 years old. When's he going to be able to buy something? Yeah. You know, I mean, we got lucky, I think, to be able to plant our flag in a single family and build equity. And most people, when they come to the retirement age, let's face it, most of their equity is in their home. Exactly. And so so I think we're heading toward a nation of renters uh, precisely because of the poor policies that we have at the federal and the state levels. Nobody wants housing. Nobody wants a NIMBY, you know, all that stuff known in my backyard. It's a supply problem. That's what I believe. Sure. Yeah, plenty of city officials that will yeah. tell you off the record, uh, we're saving every parcel we have for jobs. And if you know someone wants to live near that job, they'll have to live in the next city. Yeah. Not in my city. Yeah. I remember when that happened in San Francisco. It just doesn't make sense. Well, like, think about, people don't think about things like this. Like, let's say you have a heart attack and you live in the city. Well, how long is that response? Yeah. Like, you know, like- and the reason I bring that up is, can a fireman or a police officer live in the city? And if they can't, then that's a problem. Yeah. You know, you have to have, like, you, you have to, the servers and teachers and, you know, people that are, you know, the backbone of every community, they have to have affordability. They, you know, these are all things that, you know, and what what the government government poli uh, politicians are doing is they're they're putting red caps on it and stuff like that. It's so stupid. Like, you know, that like- That doesn't solve the problem. No, like, no. like just, just uh, you know- Decades of proving that wrong. Yeah, yeah like decades. That hypothesis. So, so, you know, what you need to do, I'm all for affordable housing. I'm all for workforce 100%. housing. I'm, I, I know you guys are. Yeah. The, a lot of those policies have worked over time. Where are they? You know, incentivize people to build- and um, maintain a peace for affordability. And that's how you solve this. Yeah. Yeah. John, how you feeling? I think we need to get to gratitude. I think this ah. is a great opportunity. Right My favorite now. section. Yes. yes. So, Kenny, um, when we first started season one, John came up with this idea that at the end, with our special guest, we get to talk about what we're grateful for. Nice. So I'm going to turn this to you first, and then I'm going to go to John after. What are you grateful for today? Well, first of all, I'm grateful for your guys' friendship. I mean, we've been in the business. Uh, it's interesting. People don't realize that even though from time to time we might be competing for people or whatever right. it is. Right, right. Good point. Um, it's really a little tight little circle we have of, of texts and friendships and emailing and, you know, over the years. Um, everybody wants everybody to succeed. Like, they're proud of everyone. Of course. You know? if there's not like a doggy dog cutthroat. So I'm grateful over the years that, um, you know, we've been able to maintain that. 100% agree. John? 
Yeah, it's either the, you know, at our household, it's the gratitude or appreciation game every mm-hmm. day with Stefan and my, my wife uh, and daughter. So I think about um, Kenny. I'll use Kenny today. Uh, he's always been supportive, uh, influential positively, uh, always hoping that there's more success, right? Regardless of where that turns, what door opens and closes. But with the friend group, with this collective, he's right, it's a tight-knit circle. Uh, I met, Just a few years ago, um, we went on a trip to Utah, I think it was. Yeah, Park City. And you're like, well, why don't you start a podcast? Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and he does it in a way, like, kind of like Big Brother, yeah. like, yeah. what the hell, man? Come on. Like, do it. Get it um, up. So, you know, I, I, I've always appreciated his encouragement. He's got a lot of things going on. He's a busy guy. Uh, a lot of life things happening to him positively, but he's always taken time to positively connect and influence myself and others in our circle. Love it. I got, I got one for you. Yeah. And this is good. So I moved here in 99 from Chicago, started out as a leasing agent uh, on a, on three different lease ups. Joined the AMA, went to did my you have first hair? couple of meetings. I did have hair. Why do you, why would you bring that up? I don't, I don't so remember. Hurtful. It's just so hurtful. I'm only it's okay. kidding. I'm only kidding. Um, don't cry. 2001, I'll do it later in the bathroom. 2001, 2002, I went to my first tributes and you were the, the MC. You oh. were the host. I'm grateful that you were the host for my first tributes because that's what just drove me. This is going to be a great career. Let's keep yeah, going. It is. I let's, love this Let's business. just follow Kenny Mack. Let's just I'm, make I'm it pissed. happen. I'm sorry. I'm upset, Allie, uh, that I missed that. <laughs> oh, I still, do you remember? It, I think you co- uh, and then you did another one with I Matt did Perrin. A, I did it a couple of years. Yeah. Well, yeah. well uh, Tom was, Shelton. Tom Shelton. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's back, right. Back uh, when we were a little less politically correct and, and could roast each oh other. Oh, my gosh. And we did. And we that did. was so good. <laughs> and by the way, was it was, it, oh, there's the, those were the best. Those were the great right? days. Yeah. I mean, we're, I'm very happy where I'm, at, where I'm at now, right, of course. But, man, those times, those, those were something else. They I are. won't share some of the backstories. <laughs> we'll leave those ones for later when we're off yeah. camera. Well, I do appreciate you guys having me on. This is awesome. Another season. On the books, starting season uh, season two, episode one. Who better than to have Mr. Ken McElroy here joining us? So thank you again. Thank Another you. episode, Thanks, Multifamily brother. Forward, presented by Mark Taylor Residential.